just like a good building. If you design a business to be coherent in its language, in its detail, in its methods, then you've got a good business too. Episode 129. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am, of course, your host, Ryan Willard. And uh, this week I travelled down to wonderful Bristol and I had the opportunity to speak with Thomas Rasher, who has a lot of experience working both in the architectural sector and in property. And he's actually the author of a number of property books called They Huffed and They Puffed, Why the Three Little Pigs Chose Their Buildings, Concepts of Value in Property and Strategic Definition Property Development Workbook. And he's got a lot of experience working in property, property valuation, contracts management, project and design management, architectural design and consulting, as well as a lot of teaching and lecturing in property around this idea of valuation and on in architecture. And um, it was really, really useful to speak to Thomas because we started to open up this conversation about how architecture can be communicated as value. How do we do that? How can we view value in property? What is value in property? How can architects learn to better align our design agendas with the business cases of our clients? And obviously, this is a conversation that I hear uh, again and again and again about how do we communicate value and I think Thomas um, really brings a lot of depth and insight into this conversation so sit back relax and enjoy Thomas Rasher. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Thomas, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Thank you very much for having me. Absolute pleasure to be here in Bristol speaking with you. So you've had a very interesting career. You've got a background in architecture. That's right. And you're now working in property. And That's right. you're working in a lot of, and you've also been the author of a number of books, They Huffed and They Puffed, uh, Concepts of Value in Property and Strategic Definitions. And you also got this appraisal document, which you've recently released. That's right. And you've got a very unique set of expertise in defining and discussing the idea of value in property and this is how That's we great. how we originally connected on yes, it was, on, yes. on Twitter yeah. um, and I think it's really interesting as well that you know you're combining that the property perspective with the architectural perspective and obviously there's not always a, a neat you know a, a neat no. join between the two um, so, not. so it's yeah. quite interesting to hear from your perspective firstly how, how did you get started what, what was your sort of career direct directory direction of travel yeah well I started as an architect and that was um, a few years ago now and I went to Germany for my first bit of work so I was in Germany about six years um, after that I went to Ireland worked as an architect there as well um, and gradually I shifted away from architecture at that point partly the strain of working as an architect was mm. too much for me um, and eventually ended up here in the UK and um, during my stay in Ireland, um, in Ireland as well as Germany, there's always something nagging me about what is in the background of architecture. Mm. So who is it who's asking for a building? Why are they asking? Uh, what do they need to know or what are they thinking to even ask for a building? Now, 
I understood how to design one and, and make one. Yes, that was clear. Um, so that led me on a path down business, learning about business. Um, and recently I did a master's in real estate finance and investment, which kind of formalized my business understanding and introduced me to the property side of business. Um, and it was a good insight into uh, something other than architecture. And the two are very, very different, actually. And it was very interesting to, to discover that. And part of my thesis um, in my master's was to look at how aligned those values are of an architect and some, a property surveyor who would look at value um, to see if there's any alignment. Mm. And people's immediate instinct was always, oh, they're not aligned. Um, and the further I dug into it, there were many reasons why they don't align. And so that was a really interesting thing to, to explore. So what, so what are those reasons? What are the kind of misalignments from your perspective are there between the architectural way of defining value in a building and how the property investor okay. or developer might define value? There, there are quite a few. And um, there's the obvious one. One looks at finance and the other one looks at non-financial values. So that's, that's a very, fairly clear, obvious distinction. Mm. Um, if you look at a valuer, they create a valuation report which is valid on a certain date given a certain set of circumstances. An architect would not think in terms of a date to consider the value. Their date will more likely be a time span or a change. So architects don't only look at a date, they look at a succession of dates, they look at change over time. Um, they look at the process of development over time, so it's not just a linear development over time, but it goes in different directions, unexpectedly so. So that, in just alone the time element, the date element of evaluation, is very different for how an architect would look at that. So in architects, we tend to look at the valuation just as a kind of static thing, as opposed to like a fluid conversational mm -hmm. thing, depending on, which has got lots of other factors defining it. Yeah. So a uh, valuation report is very clearly defined what that is. Um, evaluation on a certain date with certain criteria and more than likely it's a value as the, the, market, would you know, um, the market would consider the value of the building. Right. So in other words, what's the building if you put it on the market to sell? What's the price for that? That is a valuation document, more often than not. Not always, but mostly. Mm. By comparison, an architect wouldn't say, well, that one date... Okay, fine, but what about the people who use it? What about the process to design it? Um, what about the change of users? What about refurbishment? What about every other opportunity and impact that a building has? There, there is, there's so much that's different uh, that an architect sees, which is, can't be encapsulated within a financial figure on one date. Yes. And that, that's really interesting because you can kind of see already there being a, a tension rising because architects, we, we, it's almost, we don't want to think of it as a kind of a financial instrument that's got a, that got a price to it mm -hmm. for somebody. Yeah. So how do we as architects and how do property developers go about communicating the differences in, in value? How does it, how can it work better and what are the common pitfalls that architects and developers will find themselves either arguing about or falling out over or kind of mm. coming up against the friction, if you like. So one of, the, one of my discoveries uh, in the research uh, demonstrated that a valuation surveyor who'd be specifically focused on price um, and an architect, they almost never meet. So it's the developer or client who will be asking for a valuation that will be provided then they go to an architect. An architect will design. When that design is complete, or at least the initial design is complete, then the conversation is changed to the, to the valuer again. So there's no direct dialogue mm. happening. So it all goes via the client or the developer, mostly, out of the people I researched in my, in my thesis. So there, there isn't a huge overlap, and there's a lack of discussion partly for that. Why do, why do you think there is a lack of discussion and, and why do you think architects um, perhaps are apprehensive to engage in that discussion? I'm not sure that anyone's apprehensive. I mean, I'm sure everyone would welcome it. Yes. Um, the, the thing is the evaluation is a very rounded and very coherent thing to do. It's 
the Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors has very clear guidelines about how to do evaluation. And it's a report that just summarises a value at one point in time. So it's a piece of work and that has a clear conclusion. Um, and an architect's have, because they go through various phases in the development of their design, um, that is the opportunity um, that, that is different, I should say. That is different to the um, valuation task that, that that's put before them. Mm. It's, it's quite interesting because as architects, we exist in the kind of paradigm where we, we get very well versed in dealing with many constraints in the built environment mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. from the economic well not the economical necessarily but to the sort of technical environmental social uh you know the, the constraints of the physical site itself yeah. we, we learn to get very creative and expressive of this yeah but actually what's really kind of dictating what a building is most of the time is the financial conversation and this yeah. conversation of of value how would you suggest architects to begin to become more fluent in communicating the, the wider conversation of a building into the conversation of the value where, the, where our clients often are operating mm. in? That's a great question. Um, so let me ask you a question back, if you don't mind. Yeah. If um, an architect were to approach the client, um, how does the client consider a building? Where, in what forum do they consider a new building? In um, as in which person, what role they would have, or what group of people? Um, how do you mean? No, I'm just wondering, um, who do you think is the most important person to speak to in the client, if it's a big company? Right. Um, the I, it, it's a provocative question, yeah. and it's, it, there's no one right answer. But in larger companies where there's a board of directors, the, the person most commonly um, involved with the property is the human resources person. Right. There tends not to be a property um, executive answerable on the board. Mm. Instead, there's an HR person, and the HR person looks towards the operations and the people and how they work within the business. And that's 80% of the cost of a business. It's the people, it's not the building. So yes. invariably, uh, it's the HR person that deals with property on a regular basis right so it's the it's the people who are in touch with the users of the building essentially correct and and that begins a conversation where we're able to talk about the quality of performance of the building having a an effect on the end user yeah exactly so the hr will recognize that right um and their experience with property will be more the ongoing thing but the situation that architects have is they don't align with that because that is more facilities management that is more interior design, how you work with a building. An architect works to create a building. So that all of a sudden doesn't align anymore. So that's why I asked the question. The, um, who is it you need to talk to if the HR person isn't necessarily the right person? They're the most experienced, but not necessarily the right person. And after investigating this and mm. questioning what, who could it be, what it is it, um, an architect actually aligns most closely with the strategy of a, of a business. The reason being that strategy is um, an episodic rethink of what a building, no, what a business should be doing. And a building is not a, we do this every year, unless you're a property company. It's a, okay, this is our 10 year plan. We need a building. We need another 10 year plan, another building. It's more aligned with strategy than it is with a particular role or area of business. Wow. Okay. So this, I can see this. It's the building then becomes a kind of physical manifestation of the organisational principles and values of a business. Correct. It's part. It's a strategic objective. So you require a certain location and a certain amount of square foot and operations in a location. You need a building that's designed for that, and invariably, to match that, you require the building. It's a strategic obje objective, mm. as would be hiring all those people for that space. Yes, and I suppose when we see um, architects like Fosters and Rogers, they're very masterful at being able to explain, or Bjark Engels as well, uh, communicate the kind of a, a new way of organizing a structure or embodying 
a kind of business structure into exactly. into a physical space yeah. um, through whatever means they need to be doing it, mm. either through simple diagrams or presenting and being able to talk the same language. Exactly. And it is a different language. Business language is different, as you'll be aware from architecture. Um, but that's not to say it's not appropriate. Just, mm. just because something you, someone uses a different language, that doesn't mean to say they don't have a tacit understanding of what it is that, that's being talked about. Yeah. Um, but to, to continue the thought about strategy, um, if you look at value management as a discipline, they would teach you that the, to make a big impact for a business, it's the early intervention that would have the biggest strategic output, the biggest financial result. If you start changing your mind halfway down a process, you can't change much anymore. We know this from building the buildings. If we start building a building and then change our mind, we can only perhaps make it slightly more efficient. But if in the early stages we make um, big decisions, that will have biggest impact. So a key opportunity for architects is to recognize the added value that they create in the earliest stages of a building design and align that with strategy of the business. Got it. And yeah, so this is the opportunity with the biggest financial value opportunity. Um, and it, it's, it's um, value management as opposed to value engineering. Let me just make that distinction. Value engineering, as I understand it, is more efficiency, reducing costs. What we're talking here is increasing revenue opportunity, the triple top line, if you like, um, rather than triple bottom line. We're looking to align what is the initial purpose for the building, what do we want to achieve in the strategy, and align with that, and then the building will be perfect. Got it. Got that's, it. The, that's, that's my uh, perspective of how I understand an architect can offer a good match with a business looking for a property. And, and this can be applied to, it doesn't necessarily need to be an office building per se, where it is a very direct physical translation of an organizational mm. structure. It can be, you know, if you're working for developers, they're going to have an overarching business strategy for developments and developments That's of sites. Right. So you being able to align and ask the questions, I can even imagine just having an architect asking strategic questions of their developer, mm -hmm. um, and then finding what their kind of pain points might be or where their struggles are, they can, you can also begin to adapt your offerings to yeah. cater for that very well. That's right. I mean, they, um, there are distinct uh, client types um, who have property requirements yes. for architects. Um, I've actually explored them, but there are three types uh, that I would highlight. There's the property um, merchant, so they build property and then they sell property. Then there's the property investor, they build property and they look for stability over the long term for investment return. And then there's the third type of um, client who would be an owner occupier. So that would be your domestic house, that would be a company that looks to develop a specific building for their specific requirements. That's the real architectural opportunity because they are less focused on finance. Right. And the others, they are more focused on finance, but in a different way. One's focused on capital, one's focused on long-term revenue. So they have different perspectives, so they have different imperatives. So if the architect can match that business requirement, then they've got a better mes message in tune with the language of the client. Yes, and so, and so mastery of, of that language and kind of being able to adopt that perspective as yes. being the kind of thing that you're serving Mm -hmm. Then means that well, how, well, well, when it comes to architects kind of getting into conflicts about public housing, social housing, or things, how how do you kind of start to negotiate those kinds of um, splits? Perhaps if your client is kind of really pushing you on, you know, getting squeezing the most out of uh, out of a out of a site, mm -hmm. you know, as the architect, you that this is going to have an impact on the neighbouring city. Yeah. How do, how do you start to kind of align that conversation if it appears that it might be going against the strategic vision of the, of the business? So, well, the strategic vision of the business should be formulated. Mm. Um, and you have to go back 
to what that formulation is. If somebody, if the, the business in the first place has set the goals, the strategy, and intends to have houses, and then they complain that there's too, cra- you know, it's not enough crammed in, mm. then the strategy should be set out enough so that you can go back to it and say, no, the, the strategy is, the intention is to have a certain density that enables other aspects of it. Yes. So what, what we're looking for there is not a valuation, but an appraisal. We're looking to set out the values of a project. We're looking to set out the perspective that the business has and the opportunity that there is to establish a direction of travel. Got it. Can you go into that yeah. a bit more detail, actually, the, the difference between the valuation and, and appraisal? And, appraisal. And, yeah, and, how, and how architects can learn to be fluent in, in both okay. of these. And... So uh, let's take a market, for example. Um, there's a beautiful house and it's on the market. And the valuation would say, here's the price... Fully, that's the fair price for the this house on the market. Now, anybody who comes along again and, and sees this house and this price, they would use the same valuation and they would see the same price and they wouldn't buy it because it's the same price. There's no added value. There's no advantage. What you need is an opinion. Mm. So and someone new to this, this building, would say, I have the opinion that this building is worth more than the price which is on the market and therefore, I'm keen to buy it, or not. But it requires that opinion. Now, a, a valuation is very clearly defined. The price, the date, the circumstance. But the opinion is not a very clear definition. And I believe um, an appraisal, if it's defined as a status, as a proper type of report, mm. then that will enable people to formalize what they think, what they're after, and then compare it directly with evaluation. One is an opinion, and one is the market opinion. So the market opinion is evaluation. The appraisal is an opinion from the decision maker, the purchaser, right. or the business looking to develop whatever they want to do. Right, and then that's going to be compared to whatever their strategic exactly. plans and visions are for their own, uh, for their own businesses. Yeah, exactly. So the, a strategy for a building might align with a business strategy or it might be just to serve the business strategy or it, they might not necessarily completely align mm. because they will have different features. But there is every opportunity to find common ground and the best fit. Got it. And so what is your role now in terms of, do you work directly with architects in terms of helping them be able to make that bridge into talking more strategically and aligning their princ- their architectural principles mm-hmm. with the strategic principles of, of a business. I find that's really fascinating. That's really, yeah, really, the, really interesting. At the moment, um, my roles are on boards. So I'm on right. a few boards, social enterprise boards. Got it. Um, a community land trust board yeah. in Bristol. Um, and my connection with architecture has become... Uh, a bit more tenuous recently, yeah. but I have written a few books to kind of uh, enable that, to share that insight that I have. Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm available for consultations too. Um, so the area though between architectural and property valuation and values is exactly my area of interest. Yeah. And it is fascinating. And how, what would you say to architects who are wanting to take on the developer role themselves? Because this, this, as well as is something that's kind of emerging yeah. in the in the construction culture. I mean, mm-hmm. in order to deliver, you know, so many uh, new homes that the government keeps putting out in their white papers, yeah. independent development seems mm-hmm. a very good way of doing this. There's new ways of finding finance through, you know, yeah. various, various things like crowdsourcing, crowd, you know, crowd property, for example. Yeah. Um, finance is becoming demystified yes. in many ways. What would your advice be to architects wanting to put on the developer's hat and, and, and start working like that? Is, is there a, a new set of skills there that they need to be aware of? Um, yes, there is. Um, the business skills. It's business, mm. basically. Um, but business is not just finance. Business is an overarching perspective of a way to go forward. Um, and it's financially viable. And it's design viable. And it's livable viable. And bringing those few aspects together is, is a good business. So um, you can never read enough. You know, yeah. There's always more to learn. But having a good understanding 
of the key aspects of a business. And that includes things like what is the, the overall aim or the vision, what's the marketing plan, what is the finance plan, what is the legal plan, um, what is the product plan, in this case, buildings. Um, and then valuation has a lot to offer, the, val the property uh, area valuation, where residual valuations, where you would assess whether something is viable to, make, to go ahead with, these things are very useful tools. Mm. And it also sounds like if architects are actually getting involved in even just speculatively thinking yeah. about what they could do with the site, that they're going to become more conversant in the languages of the, the developer anyway. So even, yes, even, be, yeah. even if it wasn't, when we're, you know, we're not actually going to do this project, now we understand a kind of a little bit more about the sort of the business strategies that our mm -hmm. clients are kind of uh, kind of going through. Yeah. I think... Um, it'd be interesting to just ask yourself, <clears throat> excuse me, um, are you a developer to sell or are you a developer to keep and rent out? That's a very different decision. Mm. Or are you a developer to use the building? And your values will completely reflect that decision. It's very distinct, very distinct. If you're... Um, if you imagine you're a developer to sell the building, your cash flow is all about capital value, that you're buying a lot, you're selling a lot of money. Um, whereas an investor would put a lot of money down, but they plan for it over the long term. Yeah. So the time frame reflects that opinion. So your whole design process, your whole design ethos should be based around that kind of fundamental thinking. Got it. So there's, so there's even different types of financial values for a building. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, I mean, finance is great because it's a, like a language. It'll tell you a story just like a drawing will tell you a story. And it'll tell you your focus. It'll tell you how to emphasize one aspect over another. It'll analyze things for you like a drawing will cut through as a section or it'll be a plan. Um, finances are the same. They just look at things in different time Time scale is it a short time scale of a month, a year, or over the longer term? So if you're an investment developer, you look for the longer term. So that's the that's the balance sheet you'd be looking at. Whereas if you're looking at short term, you're looking at cash flow and profit and loss because that's the time frame you're working in. Mm. So, but all you know the tools of finance um, draw a picture that help you analyze and develop your ideas, um, and just like a good building. If you design a business to be coherent um, in its language, in its detail, in its methods, then you've got a good business too. If you had, to, you know, we can design a terrible building that has really expensive doors and the cheapest furniture and the cheapest doors and cheapest, it'd be terrible. Whereas bring, bring coherence to it mm. and then you'd have a good business too. And that's, that's really really important because architects when you put it like that the kind of analogy towards a building that we're already versant in being oh, able, completely yes yeah exactly in being able to design something mm. through iteration and our businesses are no no different okay. and and being able to kind of distinguish between the different types of financial value for a building as well particularly if we're going to be involved in it ourselves you can kind of start to see well how can that be a business asset mm. that's going to provide for the other parts of the vision of my own business yeah. and you know what what can i what can i do with these different strains and yeah. strata of the of property development that's right to um can i suggest my book yes, for this yes of course um there's this book called they huffed and they puffed right um it's a very easy to read book it's i, I read it to my daughter um she's seven um it's a story about the three little pigs and they all chose different buildings and that's because they were three different client types so it's an easy way to understand why they chose straw, because that was valid for one little pig, why they chose brick, that was valid for another, uh, and sticks was valid for the other one, based on their business plan. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting little story that explains this in simple terms, Got it. in approachable terms, uh, to make the distinction between the approach being fundamental to the choices that, that come out of it. What are other skills? So there's the kind of financial literacy that's involved in understanding uh, where a lot of the property world exists in. Yeah. What other skills are needed to be able to communicate effectively 
the value that architects can bring to a project, would you say? Okay, one of my favourites, um, which is not reflected in evaluation, um, but it is a really key important opportunity that architects can do and offer. An architect can see to the future and say, okay, we can develop a further extension to this building, or we can refurbish it, or we can create a further phase, or it can be used in a different way. Now, those are options, and options can be priced, options can be valued, and they can be discounted to today's value. So, let me give you an example. If uh, I built a house, and I chose a loft system which was either purlin or truss roof, mm -hmm. um, the purlin would be, say, more expensive. Um, I could decide, okay, how much money is that worth to do a purlin roof because I have the option of, of building my loft out. So I'd say, okay, what's the price of the loft? That's a few thousand pounds. Um, what's the likelihood of me wanting the loft? Uh, about 60%. And then I can discount that, according to 60%, back to today's value, relative to what it would be to buy, or how much worth it would be to me. And I could say, here's a figure for how much this development is worth today. An evaluation would not reflect that opinion. So that is, an, is, that is an opportunity for architects to express their value add to a business. And it's extremely important in today's climate where we have um, a lot of uncertainty. Mm. Now, what do you do in uncertainty? The, the best protection against uncertainty is options. So you have alternatives. If something goes horribly wrong, at least there's a plan B. So we've always done this. We've had phase one and phase two. Phase two will be a lot simpler if we don't have the money. It's a familiar argument we have. Yeah. But that is actually a very important opportunity to convey to a, a customer or to clients mm. that here is the financial opportunity and value we add that has not really been expressed enough. Yeah. That, that's it. It's, it's so... It's like a, the elusive obvious, obviousness. It's, mm. it's very obvious, but it's not something that we necessarily talk about in terms of, of seeing that's the huge value for a client. Yeah. Um, and it's so interesting, particularly in, in procurement of public buildings, for example, where it's really quite extreme, where the, the kind of argument about what the cost of design is, because it's yeah. the front end, you know, and we're kind of arguing over fees and the architects are kind yeah. of traditionally charging either as a percentage or they're charging by time, it's just sort of so out of line with yeah. the value that's actually being, and this kind of thing, like the, the thing that we take for granted because we do mm. it all the time, yeah. is future-proof buildings understand the sort exactly. of the latent potential of that. And actually, so, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, and just to, to, to comment on your point that you just made, there are different ways to price the work we do. Mm. So we could say, okay, I do 10 hours, I'll mark that up, double it, say, and charge accordingly. Um, that's one way. That's a cost markup. The other way is to say, okay, the building I design has a certain cost. That's 5%. I'll charge 5%. Okay. But the real value we bring is added value. And when do we bring it? At the very start of the project, at the strategy phase, at the stage zero of the plan of work. This is the value add that we bring and an appraisal, if this was formulated, could put down how much opportunity there is through architecture. And architecture is solution-focused. It is an opportunity. And these things can then be portrayed. And then, like a financial advisor, you wouldn't pay them because um, it's taken him 20 minutes to come up with a design, uh, a, design a, a suggestion. You, they charge based on their knowledge and their experience. So more like that, we, we have an added value we bring to the client and it's only fair to then charge proportionate to the value we add. Yes, I mean, and, it, and when you put it in the context of that, the, the time equation, mm -hmm. obviously as a practice, the more experience and skill you've got, your time's going down because yeah. you're getting, you know, you, you're able to kind of come up with solutions and answers much, much faster. Mm -hmm. You've got the experience 20, 30 years sometimes right. of being able to look at a site and unlock the potential in it. So to, yeah. to, to value that on time, well, you're going to be getting cheaper. Mm. <laughs> over over time because you're right. doing doing jobs quicker I mean very it's very easy to say that a client will come to you and say 
can you do a qu quick sketch design for this plot? And an architect would say, great, this is the opportunity for me to market my um, building development skills. Actually, you, that's not the focus. The mm. focus is on added value, not on further down the line to have spend 10 hours drawing a particular drawing to make you know the working drawings. Actually, refocus the opportunity to say, you want a sketch design? Okay, here is that value of added knowledge to create the opportunity that you want. And it has to be formulated. You need to know what the client actually values. What is it they're actually after? Um, and I believe that's where the opportunity is for an architect to charge correctly with the skills that they actually have, and yes. the knowledge they actually have. And how, how important do you think the the one-to-one -one communication skills are in conveying this kind of well, selling, essentially, the, the, the negotiating and the, and, the, and the selling that often... As architects, we tend to shy away from, yeah. uh, and we are, the industry is typically, you know, through proposals. You mm -hmm. send a proposal yeah. off, and you wait back to hear, and if it's if it's yay or nay, and it kind of it's a mm -hmm. sort of very difficult situation. But yeah. this is a very different. It is a radically different. Yeah. As, um, yes, and I couldn't say how difficult it is or how easy it is because each individual will take it differently, and right. you know each. Each client will have a different opinion. The uh, thing is about architecture as a business model. Mm. Um, you will not or have less repeat customers. So you have to build rapport for the one time you work with somebody. You can't build on repeat knowledge. The next best thing is, is referrals. So you would actually have somebody who knows somebody. So that is the easiest way to build the rapport and knowledge and understanding of your customer through marketing. Mm. It's very difficult to say, okay, I have arrived from Mars and I can design a good building. It's very difficult to do that. And, you know, I understand that, of course. And from your perspective as well, how about communicating value throughout the life cycle of a building? So mm. This is something that <clears throat> architects, we know intuitively that, you know, 10 years down the line, if we've designed a very high performing yeah. building, for example, I mean, at least that's something that's quantifiable. You can start talking about energy performance. And yeah. you know, it's kind yeah. of, you, you can get a bit concrete, but it seems something in the industry where architects don't tend to, um, well, there isn't really a kind of standardized system as such. I mean, I've seen various things coming out in the, of the states where they're looking at kind of quality uh, indexes for mm -hmm. uh, sort of gauging the performance or the quality of a building over yeah. its life cycle. Do you have any thoughts on, on that, on how to communicate that? Or Well, we have... Yeah. Architects are very much focused on the building process and yeah. getting it built. Um, and there is kind of a more of a push now for the post occupancy evaluations yeah. that feeds back into the to for a better design process in the future um, I think a good thought would be to assess it at an early stage what the values are of the building to be more confident that the longer term solution that the building offers matches what the initial intention was um, and then frequent reviews post-occupancy post evaluation is mm -hmm. one of those methods. Um, and, yeah, keeping an eye on it. You know, we have the tools now um, to assess energy use, to assess um, all kinds of, you know, impact on the environment, um, what other values there might be. You know, we have economic tools, we have business tools, we mm -hmm. have value management tools. Um, there are any number of tools, uh, anthropology, you, you name it. It, it. It's all useful to us. And an architect understands the, Im the influence of different subjects in what we do. Mm. Because our topic touches on all of these subjects as well. So it's actually an invitation to learn and read and find your particular way of um, bringing some knowledge into, into architecture. Amazing. So what's next for you? What are you working on at the moment? That's a great question. That's <laughs> a great question. Um, this, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously on, in the line, you know, my line of travel is to kind of explore this further. Yeah. So um, I love this area. I find appraisals is a really rich aspect to explore further. Um, on a day-to-day, -day, it's being on these boards and being involved on, you know, making decisions on business levels to see 
what property decisions, how they emerge on boards. Yeah, that's, that's where I am. Brilliant. And if any architects want to get in touch with you, um, what's the best way for them to do that? I have a website, um, www.rasha.property. Rasha is spelled R-A-S-C-H-E. Great. Dot property. Excellent. And I'll, I'll put links for all your, your books in the information of this podcast Thank as well. Much. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for having me. It was a really, really interesting conversation. Great. Thanks, Ryan. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond, or commitment, except to help you be unstoppable.